Hi there, I am Veronique Loreg from the University of Western Australia. Welcome to this course on the economics of natural hazards. I have created this video series for anyone in the natural hazards and emergency management sectors that is interested in learning how we apply economic analysis to the management of natural hazards. This project is funded by the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre. Welcome to the third video in the series. In this video, we'll look at the methods used to estimate losses from natural hazards. By the end of this video, you will know the different types of impacts or losses that natural hazards can cause, how to decide whether they are direct or indirect impacts, and whether they relate to tangible or intangible values. You will know examples of each of these types of impacts and what information is necessary to estimate the losses for each type of impact. And you will also know the difference between post-event analysis and full economic analysis that are conducted before any event happens. Assessing a wide range of hazard impacts is important in order to capture the full picture of losses, economic, social and environmental. In order to estimate losses caused by natural hazards, we need to know three things. First, what has been impacted? What are the things in the landscape that have been affected um, by the hazard, either directly or indirectly? Second, what is the degree of damage to the things that have been impacted? Is it complete damage or is it partial damage? And third, what is the value of those things that have been impacted so that we can estimate the value that was lost? Now, let's have a look at these three things in more detail. First, what has been impacted? We can categorize the impacts from natural hazards as direct or indirect and as tangible or intangible. Dire impacts are those caused directly by the event. For example, if there is a bushfire, the dire impacts are those things that were destroyed by the flames, such as houses or lives lost. In dire impacts are those that are arise as a consequence of the direct impacts, or in other words, the flow on effects of the direct damages. For example, if a fire destroys infrastructure like electricity lines and bridges, many businesses could lose money because they are unable to operate or unable to transport their products to selling points. Tangible impacts, also sometimes referred as economic impacts, are those impacts on things for which the value or cost can be readily estimated in dollars. Because these items are exchanged in markets and already have prices. These are items that are normally bought or sold or for which we buy the materials to build them. For example, houses, infrastructure, other buildings, crops, equipment, vehicles, etc. When these are damaged by a natural hazards, they are categorized as tangible impacts. Tangible impacts are called market impacts or market values by economists to emphasize the fact that these items are exchanging markets and already have prices. Intangible impacts, also referred to as social and environmental impacts, concern those things that do not, are not exchanged in markets, so they are not normally bought or sold, and therefore do not have a price. These include, for example, biodiversity, life, memorabilia, cultural heritage, animal welfare, and mental health, amongst others. Economies refer to these intangible impacts as non-market impacts or non-market values to emphasize the fact that these items are not exchanged in markets. Here, I think it's useful to have a table including examples of uh, different types of impacts. So we have direct, so we have direct and indirect impacts, which can be tangible or intangible. Examples of direct tangible impacts include buildings and contents, vehicles, infrastructure, livestock, crops and pastures, equipment, fences, plantations. Examples of indirect tangible impacts include disruption to transport, disruption to public services, disruption to essential services, disruption to production, network disruption, business disruption, cleanup cost, alternate accommodation, 
emergency and relief agencies, legal costs associated with lawsuits, tourism. Intangible direct impacts include lives lost, injuries, other health impacts, memorabilia, dislocation, environmental damage, cultural structures, animal welfare, amenity, etc. And examples of intangible indirect impacts include strengths and anxiety experience um, after the event or long time after the event, disruption to living, community cohesion and connectedness that may be lost, erosion, etc. Second, we need to know the degree of damage caused to the things that, that were impacted by the hazard, whether it is complete or partial damage. This depends on the severity of the hazard. So for instance, for bushfires, it usually depends on the level of intensity of the fire when it came into contact with the asset. For floods, it usually depends on the water depth and flow velocity. For cyclones, it usually depends on wind, sp on wind speed, etc. Third, we need to know the value of the asset's damage or destroyed. But here it is important to remember that the way we estimate the value of an asset depends on the type of assets we are dealing with. To estimate direct tangible impacts, we tend to use the reconstruction value of the asset destroyed. In other words, we measure what would cost to reinstate the asset to its formal state before it was damaged or destroyed by the natural hazard event. In other cases, like in the case of crops, we use the market value of the commodity to estimate losses and, where possible, the cost of getting the crop back to where it was before it was damaged. To estimate indirect tangible impacts, we need to collect data from emergency management organisations, public services and the businesses affected to know the extent of the losses. This is usually done through surveys after a natural hazard event. For intangible items, both direct and indirect, there is not a price that can be readily attached to them. So estimating their value in dollars requires the use of specialized techniques. We use a set of techniques known as non-market valuation, where we either look at people's behavior and infer values from the choices they make, or use surveys to get people to state their preferences and estimate values from their choices in the survey. Because estimating the losses caused by natural hazards is substantial and an essential part of any economic analysis of mitigation, at this stage it is important to make the difference between post-event analysis and full economic analysis. Post-event studies are done to measure the impacts of a single event for the purpose of comparison with other historical events. Full economic analysis, in contrast, are done in order to predict what future events could do. And these are for the purpose of making strategic decisions, uh, for example, to improve the allocation of resources, uh, make decisions about mitigation or land use planning, uh, for reducing the impacts of future events, etc. A post-event analysis, such a cost of impact assessment, is done after the event has occurred. In this case, the number of assets affected um, and how they are affected by the event is already known. For instance, we know how many houses were destroyed, how many people lost their lives or how many people were injured. Uh, we know what infrastructure was damaged and to what extent and we know which ecosystems were affected. So in this case, all we need is the value of the assets affected. We have already the other, the other part of the information that we need. Uh, so we need to know this for tangible and intangible impacts to make the estimates of uh, the total losses. After an event, it is also possible to collect information from different businesses on how they were affected by the natural hazard event um, and approach emergency management organizations, public service providers, households, etc., to know the extent and value of indirect um, losses. So when we're doing an analysis after an event, 
a lot of information is already there. It is already known because the event has already happened and there is no need to make assumptions or create models to predict the impacts or the possible impacts that um, the natural hazard could generate. In contracts, for other types of economic analysis, such as benefit-cost analysis, economic optimization modeling, or investment decision support tools, the impacts are not known because no event has actually happened and they have to be predicted. A lot of the times this is done through simulation, um, so many possible scenarios are simulated and the economic analysis is done using all the simulated scenarios. The challenge in this type of studies is that predict is, is to predict what could be damaged or destroyed by the natural hazard and how much of each asset will be damaged or destroyed. So what is affected in the landscape and to what degree. Um, so the known severity, uh, we don't know the severity of the of the impact, we don't know the severity, so we have to know we have to predict that, we have to model that. For some assets. We know where they are on the landscape and know that they don't move like houses, infrastructure or crops. Um, and if there have been enough studies um, showing the relationship between a level of severity of a natural hazard and the resulting level of damage of, to those assets, then we might be able to create functions to predict the level of damage uh, for simulated hazards. For other assets, it's a bit um, more difficult to know the relationship between severity and the level of damage because they move in the landscape, such as livestock, vehicles, etc. And in many cases, there have not been enough studies um, investigating the relationship between severity and damage so that we can predict the number of vehicles damaged, for example, or livestock killed um, by natural hazards for different levels of severity. We have the same issue for human lives. Humans also move in the landscape. But the difference here is that there have been enough studies in the past looking at the relationship between the level of severity of a hazard and the number of fatalities, or in some cases, um, as it is for bushfires, uh, there have been studies that estimate the number of fatalities based on the number of houses destroyed by a fire. Um, and because houses are a fixed asset in the landscape, so it's easy to deal with. Um, for other impacts, particularly for intangible impacts, such as how many people will suffer from anxiety after a um, natural hazard event, or how many will um, feel that they have lost community connectedness, um, we do not have enough information yet to predict this for different levels of severity. Unfortunately, because of the difficulties in predicting the potential impacts to intangibles um, from natural hazards, and given the difficulties in assigning dollar values to some intangible, many are still rarely included in full economic analysis and strategic decision making. Now to summarize. We have four different types of impacts or losses caused by natural hazards. Direct impacts, indirect impacts, and these can either be tangible or intangible. Tangible impacts are also called market impacts, and intangible impacts are also called non-market impacts. We saw a few examples of each type of impact. Direct impacts are those caused by the event coming into contact with them. So when an asset is directly damaged by the flames or the water or the wind of a natural hazard. Indirect impacts are those that emerge as a result of things being damaged by the hazard. They can extend to areas outside um, the area directly affected by the hazard and can last for much longer. Tangible impacts are those that relate to things that are already exchanged in markets or that already have prices like houses, infrastructure, crops, etc. While intangible or non-market impacts are those that relate to things that are not exchanging markets and don't usually have a price, such as life, animal welfare, biodiversity, mental health, etc. All these different impacts are easier to estimate in post-event analysis because these analyses are done after the event has happened and we already know what has been affected. 
whereas in full economic analysis, such as benefit cost analysis or economic optimization modeling, we do not have that information because we do the analysis before any event happens and we usually need to simulate the hazard events. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. In the next video, we will look at what scale to choose for an economic analysis.